tremendous today, up in Lost in Space. I think it's because of the innocence of the show. It's the nostalgia part of it. Mommy and Daddy, who watched it 30 years ago, had children. But the baby boomers today, when they think back 20, 30 years ago, when they were six, eight years old, those were good years for them. The home, the family, the mother, the pies, all that kind of stuff, you know, good things happening. To this day, there are so many fans of that television show. And uh, we actually made a trip to NASA about five years ago. And I can't tell you how many people came up and said it was because of Lost in Space that I went into the space program. Yes, we, we, we went and we, we actually watched the launch of uh, the, um, which one was it, Discovery. I created Lost in Space some 20 years ago. I knew we had something good, but the thought that it become so popular and continue to play all over the world to this very day is still quite amazing to me. Erwin Allen was a, uh, it was a tornado. When Erwin walked on the set, you knew, uh-oh, Erwin's here. That door would open on that set, and you knew it was Erwin. Go, shoom, he'd come into that set, and he'd walk in. What's going on? Why aren't we getting the shot here? You know, what's the problem? I used to call him the Emperor whenever I had to write him a letter or anything. It was always Dear Emperor. I remember that this was the most difficult and complex man. It was like, uh-oh, I better hit my mark. I better know my lines, which I always did anyway. But, I mean, everybody had this air of, like, the boss is here, is here. Let's do this right. He was a genius. He wanted excitement. He wanted energy. I had great regard and respect for the expertise which he showed in the area in which he worked. Geniuses uh, always have a reputation of being eccentric, and, and indeed, he, he was that too. You did all your own writing? Oh, yes. Did you? I, everything that you heard, I either wrote or rewrote. Yeah? <laughs> and I was a very lucky actor because for the only time in my entire career, which is, of course, vast, as we know, <laughs> I was given carte blanche to do anything I wanted. I could not believe my good luck. The Dr. Smith character, which so many people remember yes. you for, and as I quoted popular phrases that, that have been become a part of our culture, yes. initially the character was very dark and evil. The mm -hmm. first several episodes, yes. you were a, a foreign agent trying to disrupt the project, and then it changed into a very comical and very uh, warm character. I certainly changed it, didn't yes. I? Yes, you did, and that all came from you, did it not? Yes, it did. Uh, I found that to play that dreadful man, which they had, on, had in mind on the paper, had no longevity, and actors got to work. And I thought that they'd have to kill him off in five segments, because he was very unpalatable. And so I started to sneak in my little bits, for which I'm justly famous, may I say. <laughs> so you Hoping nobody would notice, <laughs> but Irwin Allen did notice. And he came over one day, and he said, I know what you're doing. I said, oh, and he said, do more. A few really nice scenes with Guy in the series. A couple of teary moments together, a couple of father-son moments with a beautiful John Williams theme. You know, da na 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 It was really nice. And uh, the antimatter man. cherish them and I, I wish we'd had more. I was supposed to be a biophysicist in it so uh, if I had an opportunity to go back and play it again I would like to have some more experiments going. I had done um, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea for Irwin and on the second day he came down and he said uh, want to do another series? I said yes I would like to. How much time was there between The Sound of Music coming out and you transforming into Miss Penny Robinson? Not a whole lot of time. Uh, I started doing some Lost in Space, about a year later, I was 13, and that was on the 20th lot. When Sound of Music ended, I actually stayed on the studio lot and did my schooling there. <laughs> um, I, I think they wanted to put me into something else, but they didn't know what they were going to do with me. And then uh, Irwin Allen's uh, Lost in Space came along. I was called into the office by Irwin Allen, and uh, he, I think, had seen me on the Danny Thomas show. And I was cast, and that was kind of a, a cult role, you know. To this day, there are so many fans of that television show. Will was a pretty inspiring character, you know. He was a genius. Uh, he, was, he was polite, 
but he listened to his own inner voices. If Dad said, no one leaves the ship till dawn and I return. And he realized, well, if I don't leave the ship, you know, your ass is grass, he left the ship. Will, you come back here, do you hear me? When I tell you to stay and protect the family, don't you ever leave your post again, understand? He was a great character to play, and I very much enjoyed playing him. Oh, uh, well, I started working as an actor when I was five years old, and, uh, you can't escape your destiny, you know. I was uh, I broke my leg when I was four playing Zorro, and I stayed in with a cast watching Zorro and Superman, and I wanted to get inside that television set like a adventurer, a caped adventurer. Working with the children on the set, as they were at that time, was marvelous. I had a lot of work to do, you know. Will Robinson had a pretty heavy workload. When you're a kid, you need to, you know, fulfill your school requirements. So you have to go to school for three hours uh, every day. The hardest part was going into rehearse like a two or three page scene where you've got a lot of dialogue and remembering your marks and all that stuff. And then as soon as they start lighting it, being rushed off to a trailer to forget about it and go to school. And it's intense studying at that time. I mean, you go in and you have to get right to work. And then you're pulled out and all of a sudden you're on some planet, you know, facing some alien. <laughs> Happy moments were uh, eating. We used to go to lunch. Those were good moments. <laughs> Shriver salads. Yes. At 20th uh, commissary. Yeah, sometimes we would wear our spacesuits off the lot and, like, go to the mall That's true. for lunch. People would look at us relatively strangely. And Angela would buy... Um, a Nancy Drew book, and I would buy a Hardy Boys book. Angela would buy a Beatles album, and I would buy a Bob Dylan or a Kingston Trio album. My agent told me, he said to me, Mark, if you do the pilot of a Lost in Space, no one will ever see it, I promise you. We, we know it was a pioneer. It was a year before Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So you pioneered space television shows as well as the scientific sci-fi type special effects. But being on the set, your memories of the sci-fi stuff you were trying to create. Well, 32 years ago, it was like a lot of firecrackers going off all over the place, and you had to go left and right, and the camera would tilt as you went, and Erwin Allen, who was the producer, would hit this tin can, and mm -hmm. he'd go to the left, and the tin can, you'd go to the right. So, uh, you know, that's the spaceship going all over the place, and that's mm -hmm. how we did it. And, uh, of course, June Lockhart called me Crash West, because each week we had to have a new show, so I had to crash the spaceship onto a new planet every week. And I said, well, I'm not so sure. What's it about? And they said, well, Space Family Robinson. Born in Norway, she was adopted by a local couple when she was five, living in Farmington until she was 15. I was so happy that I was raised in Michigan. It was, um, it, I think it was a grand place to, to be um, a child. Marta says her childhood was magical. She acted in theaters at Wayne State and in Bloomfield Hills. Remember Judy there? Well, oh, she's beautiful. Happened? Well, I mean, if she and I didn't get together, and there'd be something wrong with me. I mean, yeah. you know, and there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, uh, she's a beautiful young lady. Look at that face. Beautiful. She was about 20. Uh, she was married, and I was married. Mm -hmm. So we really couldn't consummate any kind of relationship, because I think we, we were attracted to each other, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, uh, we didn't do anything about it. We oh. just didn't. We, we, we respected each other's, uh, you know, spouses and where we were at. And though we had that crush, you know, it's just a crush. That mm. happens and, you know, we just didn't follow it through. Bobby was extremely passionate about his role, okay? I mean, I wouldn't say he was a method actor, but the guy really loved being the robot. I mean, you know, his, his chair was painted silver. His dressing room was painted silver. Uh, and he just loved being in there. You'd think, I would think that any opportunity I would get to get out of there. If this is a small model of the outfit that I wore every day. It was around six foot to six five, something in that vicinity. In the full outfit, it weighed 350 pounds. The bottom section we called the legs. I would get into that first by stepping on here and then stepping into it. Then they would put the bodice on me. Then they would attach the top. I looked out. The bubble was the head. That's why Jonathan Harris called a bubble-headed booby. Dr. Smith is a bubble-headed booby. In my opinion, it is he who does not compute. Bubble-headed booby.
Bob probably, of everybody in the cast, had the toughest job physically of anybody. He was locked inside the robot for good reason. They didn't want him to get out. No. The character just kind of evolved. I had a button inside built into the claw, and with every syllable of every word that I spoke, that light would blink. They gave me uh, earphones. I had to sync with his lines. Robot's work is never done. We became a team, and that's the important thing. My agent got a call one day, and he said, Erwin is looking for a robot voice. So I go down there, I meet Erwin, and I said, I presume, Erwin, what you're looking for is a mechanical, robotian kind of sound. William Shakespeare, 1564. 16. And Erwin says, my dear boy, that's exactly what I do not want. This is a advanced civilization. I want a highly cultured approach. I said, OK. And I'm saying, warning, warning, it does not compute. And the Irwin's saying, no, no, that's not right. Do it again. Try this. No, that's not right. Finally, he says, after about five minutes, listen, he says, we're not getting it. Thank you for coming in. You're still the narrator on the show. I start to walk out. And now, just uh, God knows why, I say, Irwin, let, let me try one more thing for you. And now, in my best mechanical, robotian voice, I say, danger, warning, it does not compute. And Irwin says, my God, what the hell took you so long? Oh, yes, we used to do a whole number. We had an act, which we did, for the kids. And they were goggle-eyed because they didn't know that there was anybody in the robot, you see. And here I was doing a whole number, you know, with the alliteratives, your bumbling booby, bubble-headed booby, Neanderthal ninny that you are, that sort of thing. And the kids were deliciously fascinated with this because they didn't know that that was not a real robot. And then we took that away from them, and I thought that was wrong. Erwin Allen it allowed it to be publicized that there was somebody in the robot, you see. I thought that was bad. It shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened. And I voiced my uh, feelings about that, but it didn't do me any good. You know, uh, Bobby was very comfortable in there, and he, was, he, he did a fantastic job as the robot. I mean, I can't sing his praises highly enough as the, the actor that he was inside there, because not only did he have to memorize and give us all of the dialogue, he had to do the technical stuff at the same time, plus be inside this, you know, fiberglass shell, plus uh, at many times carry the burden of like hundreds of pounds on his shoulders and still be able to, to act. I, I mean, he's an unsung hero of the 60s.